let me welcome to the show uh, my partner in power this Wellness Wednesday, the one and only Broadway Tony diva actress, producer extraordinaire. The Red Pill is her latest project. Tanya Pinkins, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming through. She's in Panama, y'all. And let me welcome back, of course, Dr. Fitzhugh, uh, Valerie Fitzhugh. When you hear a doctor trying to, and I was like, why did you say we have no evidence yet? Or just, just say there's no ev- evidence. Don't give, don't give any qualifiers. These people are just, ooh, they're just so ignorant. How do you feel listening to them scream and yell at this woman, this doctor? I mean, my face told the whole story. I just, I, you know, I'm floored, but I agree with you. You say, don't give the qualifier. Just say there is no evidence to support that. Because I will tell you, I work with a lot of OBs in my practice as a pathologist, and they have been very, very loud and very vocal about the fact, and their society has supported them, that there is no evidence that these COVID vaccines will affect fertility. In fact, as a pregnant woman, you're at higher risk of getting COVID. So if you're not vaccinated, you're at more risk. Listen, Emmy Rossum, the actress, uh, told everyone they're an idiot. She, she got vaccinated while she was pregnant and she found that her daughter, her baby daughter, has now antibodies to fight COVID. So she was like, stop playing. Yeah, so, but let's, let's break it down. Let's break it down for everyone out there. What is, I, I did Moderna. And so Moderna and Pfizer both use the MNRA. And I did, I chose Moderna because of Dr. Kizmekia. I was like, okay, she, she was the brain behind this particular Moderna uh, vaccine. So, and I know Christy Purnell, who's a colleague of yours as well. She was in the trial. She was on, I, I sat on that fence for a long time till my booty hurt. Cause I was on that fence for a long time. I was like, no, no, I'm going to keep my immune up. I'm going to drink lemon water. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do all the things and stay away from people and wear a mask. I won't catch it. But then people started wanting to come around me. And I was like, I'm going to turn into an agoraphobic old lady with cats. It's not going to be cute. So I made the decision. But what does the vaccine, each one, J&J, Moderna, Pfizer, how are they different? What do they do? So the J&J virus, the J&J vaccine rather is different from Moderna and Pfizer. So we'll handle those two together in a second. The J&J virus is what we call an adenoviral vaccine. 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 I'm sorry, vaccine. Woo, Lord. The J&J vaccine, the Janssen vaccine. Sorry, y'all. The J&J vaccine is an adenoviral vector vaccine. So what they use is a little bit of bacteria. They code the virus into the bacterial genome, and then they put that into your body. Your body sees it as foreign and tries to fight it, creating an immune response. You don't get you don't get sick from the adenovirus. That that is broken down. It goes away. But what what happens that's important is now your body has code to make antibodies because they've seen what we call an antigen, that part of the pathogen that wakes up your immune system. So that, again, this is the immunology. So when your immune system is turned on, you start to make antibodies to the co- the COVID virus, the coronavirus that's causing this disease. That's good news because if you have antibodies from the vaccine, one, you don't get as sick. And if for some reason you do get COVID, because yes, we've heard about those breakthrough um, infections. We can talk more about that later. Once you're exposed to actual COVID, your body has a much better chance of fighting it. So that's one way. And the J&J um, vaccine, as you guys all know, is one shot. So that's Can I very ask helpful. a question about that? I got to ask a question about that. So what was part of what COVID was doing was that the immune response from people was so strong to the actual virus that it was acting like an autoimmune disorder and over attacking the body. And that was what was causing people to get sick. So how is this different than that, that sort of storm response that the body was doing to COVID in some patients? So the vaccine, and that's all true. The vaccines don't overdo it. So you get just, because getting the vaccine is not like getting the full blown illness. You're getting the part of the virus that you want your body to react to. So when you get that vaccine with that bit of, with that code that's in that bacterial vector, your body says, okay, that's foreign. I don't know you. I have to respond to you. And so you respond. So wait, wait, but pa- not pause, Dr. Fitz, Fitz, you. But sure. if you are then exposed to COVID mm-hmm. and you have that, that thing awakened, now you have even more soldiers to fight. In Tanya's scenario, we the body overdid it. So now you have even more. Is that going to cause that tsunami that created the you know 
the negative outcomes and the intubations and all of that? No, because once you've been exposed to that vaccine and you make those antibodies, those antibodies now protect you. So those, so, so you don't have, when you get sick with COVID and you haven't been vaccinated, you don't have those little soldiers. You don't have the antibody. So if you don't have that antibody, that virus is going to wreak havoc on you because there's nothing to stop it. Your body's never seen it. Whereas with the vaccine, your body has essentially seen a copy of that virus without all the horrible getting sick. So now you've got soldiers on board. If you get exposed to COVID, the soldiers knock it out. That's the whole okay. point of getting that vaccine is so that you don't get, you don't, if you get sick, because again, we've seen breakthrough, you're not sick to the point where you're intubated in the ICU or you die. And that's why the vaccine is so important. Most of these people who've gotten these breakthrough infections, they're at home. It's not fun, but they're at home. They don't have to go to the hospital. They don't have to be admitted. They're not intubated. And that's huge because I can tell you, and I know Dr. Purnell could tell you, that first wave of the pandemic was horrific here in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. I mean, the numbers of cases we saw, the intubations, you know, turning people from their backs to their stomachs, trying to help them breathe every day. You know, the more, I mean, our morgue was, because this is part of pathology, our morgue was so full, we had trucks in our parking lot to store bodies of people who died. I, I don't think fear is a good motivator. I think it's a dangerous motivator. I think facts, science are a good motivator. So here's my biggest question. You know, when I was in law school, one of the things my professor said was, if you can convince someone that two plus two is five, you've done your job. And one of the challenges I think that is facing a lot of people is that the information that we've been getting has been two plus two is five. Oh no, two plus two is six. Oh no, two plus two is eight. And we've been being asked to believe things and then not believe them and then believe them and not believe them. So it's difficult to believe anything when we know that these masks really, really do help go a long way. Yet they say, oh no, don't wear a mask. Oh, do wear a mask. Oh, don't wear a mask. Oh, do wear a mask. So I think for a lot of people, it's like, how can I believe anything you say? The mask is this simple little thing and you can't even decide about that. So I hear you because that's real. That's absolutely real, but the science behind it, and that's what's important, the science and the facts. So the facts have shown over 99% of the people who are in hospitals right now, this Delta variant are not vaccinated. That's a fact. So those of us who are getting vaccinated, and I was in the Moderna trial also, so I'm also a Moderna, okay. Moderna alumnus. The reality is people who are not getting vaccinated are putting themselves at risk. And I'm not trying to scare people because I'm not, I'm not in the business of fear tactics. I'm not, that's not my thing. But I do want people to know that this is a risk they're taking. The masks, I agree with you, do go a very long way. I've been masked up for months, mostly because now I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. Those children cannot be vaccinated yet. And the so shedders I have to and the spreaders. My... It's... The shedders <laughs> and the spreaders. That's what the children are, the shedders and the spreaders. And so I have to protect them, right? So I wear my mask. I wear my mask everywhere, even though I'm vaccinated. I think people got very comfortable when Delta wasn't as virulent in this country yet. And it was, all right, we can take the masks off. Now we're vaccinated, it works. The problem with COVID-19, I'm gonna be very real with you, is because it's new, we're learning everything on the fly. This isn't like chicken so, pox or measles or mumps where we, we've known this for decades. So here's a big question I have. Japan has been shut down for almost two years. They, have, they didn't let any foreigners visit. And I'm sure that anyone coming in from the Olympics had to be either tested or quarantined for two weeks. So how does that Delta virus variant suddenly be spiking in Japan, which has been shut down for two years? I hate to say this out loud, but people are clearly bringing it with them. Now, what people are looking for clarity on, and we're still trying to figure this out, is how much virus can a person who's vaccinated carry? because they may not be getting sick. And that's why, and that's how you know the virus, the, the vaccine is working. If you're not getting sick, that vaccine is working. But what if you're carrying the virus? Because you know who's at risk then? The unvaccinated folks. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways it may have got to, now this is me hypothesizing being the scientist that I am on the fly. One of the ways it may have gotten there is that people brought it with them. It's a respiratory virus. So it's in the nasal passages, it's in your lungs or the so-called respiratory tree. That's where it is. 
So if folks are bringing them with them, that's how it gets there. You, it can't get there without having a vector to help it travel through the air. And unfortunately, people are that vector. So if they had never seen it, I mean, travel, I think people have to be very careful about travel. Like, I'm not willing to put my children on a plane right now. It's close quarters. Yes, you have to be masked on a plane, but I'm not sure that everybody who gets on that plane is doing everything that they're supposed to do. I'll get in a car and drive. If I'm going to travel, that's how I'm going to do it. It's safer. So we just have to be cognizant about our travel, the risks to the people we love and the people we live with. You know, if that if I'm walking around now, this is an example, of course, if I'm walking around right now with COVID-19 in my nasal passages, I feel great. I'm having a great day today. But I go home and kiss my kids or breathe in their face. Well, now I just expose them and they have no protection. So a lot of it is we're learning every day more and more about this virus because it didn't exist before December 2019. At least we think it didn't exist before December 2019. I'm not going to get into the drama behind that. <laughs> We're with Dr. Valerie Fitzhugh. Tanya Pinkins is here as well. Uh, so you just told us about what J&J does. What do Moderna and Pfizer, which both use MNRA, what do they do? So the mRNA viruses are a little bit different. And as you have vaccines, Lord, I keep doing that. The mRNA vaccines are a little bit different. They're both two doses. So you get one dose and then you get the second a month after. You're not, and with either vaccine, you're not considered fully immune until 14 days after the second dose for Moderna and Pfizer and the first or the first and only dose for J&J. So what's different about the mRNA, uh, mRNA vaccines, and again, you get a shot usually in your arms, upper arm, instead of being, instead of being carried on a bacterial vector, you get this, you get a substance called mRNA. It's, um, it's a ribonucleic, a messenger ribonucleic acid. And the messenger part is important because that messenger RNA carries a message. And so the cells use that message to make the protein. The protein, of course, is that antibody. Again, those little soldiers that are going to fight the disease if you get exposed to it. Once those antibodies are made, the cell breaks down the mRNA and gets rid of it. So it's not gene therapy. The mRNA doesn't go into your nucleus, which is where your DNA is. It doesn't combine with your DNA. It simply gives the, it gives the message. Your body then, because your body's smart, will translate that message into a protein. That's the antibody. And then that antibody is in your system to protect you should you be exposed. And you, your body essentially learned the process of being, of protecting itself from COVID. So now the variants come. The body doesn't recognize because the, the virus has mutated to, because it's smart as well, might be smarter than we are. It's mutating so that it can go from host to host so that it's undetectable, right? So now we're gonna have to have boosters or how does the MNRA uh, tell the cells, hey, this is something new or can it? So the message that's made is a message of something called the spike protein. And the spike protein is a very conserved area of the entire message of that virus. So usually when there are mutations, and this is why the vaccine is for the moment is still working against these variants. When the virus mutates, the, spoke, the spike protein tends to be what we call conserved. So there aren't many changes in that spike. The changes are in other parts of the virus's message. So because your body still recognizes that spike protein, your antibodies, those little soldiers will come in and be able to fight it. Now here's That's a question I have. Mm -hmm. So a, a virus is not trying to kill anyone because it needs a host. It is not ever trying to kill anyone. So what is, we know that any virus, even the bubonic plague or whatever, there are some people who are immune so what happens for those people who are immune? Like if they just have a natural immunity or say this woman whose baby has been born with an immunity, why should they get the vaccine? We still have no idea how, that's called natural immunity, by the way. What you just described is a process called natural immunity. So anytime you get sick, your body learns to make antibodies for most of us, for those of us who are healthy and don't have immune compromising conditions like cancer, or some autoimmune diseases, your body will learn how to protect yourself against that virus. And that's why hum humanity goes on. The problem is, of course, then you get the mutations and, and you have the issues. But as long as your body learns, you're good. And that's how this all works. So the issue with COVID is we don't know how long that natural immunity lasts. And that's why we're recommending in the science, the medical community, that everybody who can be vaccinated be vaccinated. 
because we have no idea how long natural immunity lasts. Is anybody doing studies of people with this natural immunity to see if that's something that can be, you know, put into something to give to other people? So people are looking at natural immunity. There are some studies from what I've heard that are basically taking people's blood and testing to see what their antibody levels are. Antibodies can be sneaky though. Your mm -hmm. antibody counts can drop really low and you might think you're not immune, but if you're exposed, they'll shoot up sky high because the numbers of the antibodies don't need to necessarily be that high in some people until they're exposed. And then your body knows what to do. Humans are, our, our bodies are brilliant. And that's why a lot of us, you know, a lot of us who have had COVID, thankfully I have not been in that category, are still here to talk about it because our COVID? bodies figure it out. Did you have COVID? I did not, thank Lord, I have not. All right, um, and, and on that natural immunity, um, are there, because there's a lot of people, holistic folk who refuse to get the vaccine because they, you know, they're, they keep their immune system good. They have no underlying conditions. What do you say to them? So, and again, I don't like fear as a tactic because it, it doesn't work. But what I do tell them is you may think you're young because you know, a lot of the holistic health folks are very young, very healthy, but these are the people who are exercising six days a week. They look great. They smell great. Their life is wonderful. But then you tell them, look, it's the people like you. I mean, you don't think you can get sick. You don't think you're going to be that bad. And most of the time, yes, the people who get really, really sick have the underlying conditions. They have heart disease or they have diabetes or they have obesity, all the things you hear about. But we're seeing more than enough of very healthy people get sick and die from this disease. And my thing is, yes, if you get the vaccine and you may feel crummy for a day. I mean, I did. I didn't feel great after the second shot. So I knew my immune system was at work. You don't feel great. But then the next day you're fine. Whereas with COVID, for one thing, you can be sick for a week, two weeks, a month, you don't know. If you're a long hauler, forget it. And I know people who are long haulers who are still now almost a year since diagnosis or more still have issues and symptoms from COVID. Whereas you get the vaccine, you may feel crummy for 24 hours.